Well, again, welcome today. Uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for just, just being here. Um, I pray that your, your heart is open and your mind is open to maybe what God has to speak right into your life. Whatever you're going through, and I, uh, I think today is going to be pretty relevant to all of us, whatever season we're in. Um, we're in the second week of our series. We're working through a series called The Last Words of uh, Jesus and from the cross. We're kind of looking at uh, four of the phrases that Jesus spoke from the cross. There were seven of them in, in total, but we've, we've kind of pulled out four of these leading up to Easter. Uh, and so we talked about last week, uh, Father, forgive them for they really don't know what they're doing. We talked about the challenge of forgiving people and uh, accepting God's forgiveness and, and, and his identity that he says that we are, not who the world says we are, and, and working through how to forgive people. And so if you missed that, you can, you can check that out as well. But today we're going we're gonna to kind of work through the phrase, it's simple, it's, it's why, God, why? And this is one of the most puzzling ones to me that, that Jesus, you know, you wonder why would he ask why? Why would he need to wonder? And so to kind of set up this, this series, um, we're going to read this, this passage throughout the series, especially for today in Luke chapter 23, 32 through 33. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And what we pull from that is, and we're going to get into this uh, as, we, as we work through the series, but we get out of this is that he was innocent. It makes a point to say that there were two criminals. They were known criminals. Uh, they weren't denying being criminals, um, that Jesus was innocent. And so he was hanging between those two criminals. He came to pay the debt that you and I couldn't afford. It's our sin that placed him on the cross that caused him to need to die. And so he was that final sacrifice for our sin, even though he was innocent. And so the passage we're going to work through today is in Matthew chapter 27, 45 through 46. It's him on the cross. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lema sabbatnia. Let me just pause for a second because I practiced that all week. Can I just take a deep breath? And I'm sure it was wrong, okay? Here's what it really means. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, why did Jesus ask why? It's on the cross. Why did he ask why? Now, we need to put ourselves in the, in the place of the people on the ground, the people around the cross. What would they have heard when he said this phrase? I think they would have heard the psalm of the cross, which David wrote and prayed in Psalm chapter 22. You can read it for yourself. But in that, that psalm, he begins with these very words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then you read through the rest of the psalm, and it finishes with, it is finished. That's how it works. And so way back then, David was going through the same kind of, not the same kind of stuff, but he was going through this, God, where are you at? Why aren't you involved? Why aren't you engaged in my life? And all of a sudden, you fast forward, and the people, and why it's important, the people would have heard, because they knew Scripture, they would have heard, David prayed that, and now Jesus is praying that. So what that made and what it meant for them and what it means to me is that, man, he can relate to me. If he can relate to David, and I know I can relate to David, even though you know, David was filled with sin, and maybe that was why he was kind of feeling forsaken. He was far from God. He wasn't in God's will for that season. But Jesus was innocent, and they knew he was innocent. So why would God forsake him? Why would he feel forsaken? And so in that moment, they would have had this, this moment of, man, he understands, I've felt forsaken. And if Jesus feels forsaken, if Jesus is asking why, then what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me? But the main reason that Jesus cried out is what the people would have heard. But for the big picture and, and beyond that moment, it's because he was taking on our sin. That's why he felt forsaken. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
So what that tells us is that God was part of the plan because we understand the Trinity. We understand that God the Father, God the Son, God the, God, God the Spirit are up in heaven. There's Trinity. And they were having this conversation. They know the plan. Jesus knows why he came. So why, if he knew the plan, would he still ask why? Was he suddenly filled with some kind of doubt? Was he suddenly feeling like, I wonder if this is really mattering? Was he, was he feeling like this despair? Well, these same people... Right? The human side of Jesus, we have to ask why. These, these same people were chanting and praising his name, Hosanna, 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 to the king. We welcome you in this triumphal entry as he's descending the Mount of Olives, going into Jerusalem. They're laying palm branches down before him as he's riding in on this donkey. And they're just praising him, thinking that he was going to come over and take over the Roman Empire. But now all of a sudden, from their perspective, they think that the plan is just messed up. He, our leader, is now dying. And so was Jesus asking what they were asking? This is all over? This has been a wasted plan? Absolutely not. I think it's a far different perspective that Jesus was taking. The point was still the same on the cross as it was in the garden. If you read the Garden of Gethsemane, you begin to work through the prayer that Jesus was praying. Jesus did not want. I have to be very careful theologically right here. If there was another way Jesus could have paid for our sin, if, if we could just, just live right, right? If we could just do it right. But he knew we couldn't. He knew on our own we would never be good enough. Never be able to live right on our own. So he knew that he had to die. What he wasn't afraid of was the pain. He was willing to suffer the pain for you and for me. What he didn't want to experience was the feeling of sin because he had never felt that before. And if you think that I'm talking to everybody else but you today, I'm talking to everyone today. We understand what sin feels like and the consequence. When we've done something wrong or we haven't done something God wants us to do, we feel that guilt, we feel that shame, and we're overwhelmed by it. And then you just magnify that by the billions and trillions of people throughout history. All of a sudden, Jesus is not just taking on your sin and my sin. He's taking on everyone's sin. So the reason why, even though he knew the plan, the reason why Jesus felt that forsakenness is because he endured separation from God that you and I deserved. He felt what we've felt. But the truth is, and it's profound to me, is that he was willing to endure it so that we could be freed from it. He took on our sin. He took on our shame. And so if you're sitting here today and you say, well, I'm always going to live like this. I'm all No, 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 no. You can be freed from that guilt. You can have life. Not just conversion. You can have life. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for, for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. He took our place to bring you to God. It's awesome to think about that Jesus hung on the cross and all of a sudden is he taking on the sins of the world? He's taking on my sins and your sins and he's, he's just hanging there and he, in the moment where he takes on the sin, God the Father, and we don't kind of understand this, but he couldn't look upon sin and so he, he turns around and in that brief moment, Jesus was like, we've never had this happen before. You've always been with, I've always felt connected to you. And so if this is what sin is like, then God, I don't want any part of this. I'm willing to die so that no one ever has to feel that way. And so I remind you, and I can't say this as clearly and as passionately enough today, is that you don't have to live a life separate from God. You don't have to live another day without the shame, without the guilt of anything you've done. And it's not only that. That. He's offering you life. He's offering you strength. He's offering you power, not just to be forgiven from the sins of the past, but to live a holy life today and beyond. He's offering us life. So why might we feel forsaken? And some of you are like, man, when are we going to get to these notes? How long is this going to be? I know who you are, right? Here we are. So why might we feel forsaken by God? Maybe 
Maybe there's been some distance between you and God. You felt like that spark is not there. You've done if you've dated someone or you've been married or whatever. You had a friend that y'all just weren't connecting. So it's on a whole different level with, with, between you and God. You just didn't feel like things were right. You, you knew that... You know that you need to be closer. Maybe you feel like he's asking too much of you. Maybe the burden seems too heavy for you. You're saying, God, I'm, I'm wanting this and I'm wanting that. I want you to heal this, do this, fix this. But God's response is no or it's wait. And so in that place, in that season, you maybe feel forsaken. Number one, why might we feel forsaken by God? Maybe it's a result of sin. Let's just get right to it at the beginning. Maybe it's a result of sin. And I'm going I'm to divide this, this point up into two parts because I think, I think it's very important that we understand there's two parts of, of, of how God is dealing with sin. So the first part is he's offering salvation from sin. Okay, so, so if I'm not a child of God, if I've never invited Jesus into my life, I've never experienced salvation, I've never experienced uh, that, that step of faith toward him so that he's breathed life into me, then what does that look like? It's really simple, and if you've grown up in church, just, you know, just roll with it real quick. It, it's as easy as ABC. Anybody ever grown up in church? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? So it's easy as ABC, but I want some people who maybe you've never been part of that, you've never heard it that way, I want you to listen to it very clearly. The first step is we admit. We admit that we're sinful. We admit that we need Jesus as our Savior. We admit that we can't li have life outside of God. We recognize that we are sinful. We recognize that we have sinned, and we have not yet asked Jesus to cover our sin. And so therefore, we are forsaken by God because we are not part of God, and we've never invited him to cover our sins. So we admit. We just say, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. And then secondly, we believe. We believe that Jesus died to offer us life. And it goes beyond this. It's not just about offering us life. It's, it's not just about offering us rescue, should I say. It's not just about me being rescued from hell and eternal punishment. It's about offering me life today and life tomorrow. If we're searching for some kind of rescue so I can just get rid of the guilt, if I can just say I'm sorry, that's not what biblical belief is. It's not about I've got caught, let me just, you know, accept the punishment and move on. That's not how God works. So he wants us to put our faith in him, say that we believe in him, and we trust in him, not just for, as some would say, the fire insurance. And then see, confess your sins to God. The cool part in here, we don't have a box at New Hope Church anywhere, okay? We don't have a box, and I sit in that box and wait on you to come. Brian, I have sinned this week, and these are my sins. And then I tell you what you need to do. That that's not the way it works. You don't need to confess your sins to me. You don't need to confess your sins to anyone. You, you confess your sins to God, and then he offers forgiveness for those sins. So maybe you're sitting here today, and you feel distant from God, maybe, maybe because you've never genuinely given your life to him. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, real quick, says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So what he wants to do is he wants to step into our life, help us to admit that we've been sinful, that we are sinful, that we need his grace, and then once we do that, he accepts us in. And he begins this what we would call this process of being sanctified into his likeness and set apart from the world so that we can be more like him. There can be no intimacy between us and God until we properly deal with the sin in our lives. And that's an ongoing thing. We're never going to have the in intimacy that God wants until we understand we've got to deal properly with the sin in our lives. The second part of this, real quick, is not just salvation from sin, but discipline in sin. Once we become God's children, you know how we're going to act when we become God's children? We're going to act like children. We're going to do the wrong things. We're, we're going to say the wrong things. We're, we're going to be lazy. We're, we're, we're going to you know, not forgive. We're going to hold grudges. Right? We're not going to show compassion. We're not going to be inclusive. When we're young Christians, you know what we do? When we have friends, you know what we do? We huddle up. 
And as we mature, what God wants us to do is He wants us to widen the circle a little bit. He wants to be not exclusive, but inclusive. He wants us to love people. He wants us to forgive people. But early on in our faith, and unfortunately even later on, we kind of drift back sometimes, but, but, but early on, we want it to still be about us. And God is changing that. He's always changing it. And so as a good, loving Father, He's going to discipline us. He's going to withhold things from us that we think we deserve, that we think we want. How many of us growing up, we wanted to eat all the sweets we could, and we wanted dessert before dinner? How many of us grew up? You guys like that? All right, dessert before dinner? We've got some adults in here. I would choose dessert over dinner, too. But understanding our, our loving parents say, no, you have to eat those green beans, right? You've got to eat the green beans. That's how it was in my household. You've got to eat the greens before you eat the sweets. And so what I would do is I would eat them. I think that my brother liked it, maybe why he could hit more home runs than I could, but he liked the veggies. And so we would strike a deal sometimes. We'd sit close enough so I'd shovel the greens over to him, and maybe I suffered the consequences as a result of that. And so, so I would get the sweets, but with not having to eat all the greens. And then eventually, you know what? Because good parents are good parents, and they find out. And so then you go a week without sweets because you cheated. Anybody? Is that just me? Understand that, that God the Father, on a much grander scale, He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows when we're trying to cheat the system. He knows when we're asking for things for the wrong reasons. So what if? What if you're feeling distant from God because you're wanting Him to do something that He's saying, no, 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 I need you to do this. You're wanting Him to fix that person, but what if He's wanting you to be an instrument and a vessel to love them toward Him? What if, what if they're going to be changed because you're being changed in their presence? What if you're praying for somebody to be reached for him, then he's wanting you to help him reach them for him? He's not going to fix everything. Sometimes he's going to ask us to grow up. Discipline from God is grounded in God's fatherly love for us. Even when things aren't going your way, it doesn't mean that God's not loving you. It may mean that he's disciplining you because you're not following his will wholeheartedly. And he's wanting you to grow up. Number two, why might we feel forsaken by God? Number two, maybe it's a result of misplaced priorities. And what does that look like? What, what, what does this look like? Anything hindering your intimacy with God or connection with biblical community. Anything that's doing that is, is, is maybe a reason that God, you may feel distant from Him. You see, every day we should strive to just examine. We should strive to please Him, to honor Him, to make sure that what we're doing is, is what He's longing for us to, doing, uh, to do. Our desires are His desires and vice versa. The problem is that life happens. And occasionally we drift off course. We make these seemingly minor compromises. And then all of a sudden we look up one day and we're like, how did I get here? How did I get here? Some of you are going through stuff right now that you didn't choose this. But if you look back honestly, you look back and there were some compromises along the way. And so you're distant because you're distant. And it's not God, it's maybe you. So what does it look like in real life? A couple, couple of examples. One, maybe, maybe we miss one day on our version Bible app plan. We miss that day. We wake up. We wake up a little bit late. We hit the snooze button too many times, and that's our time with God. We skip it. We just forget about it, and we get to the end of the day, and we go, man, I'm just too tired, and we just miss that day. Whatever the case may be, whatever the reason, maybe with the super holy, right? Or you did the devotion, but you didn't get anything out of the devotion. Does that cover everybody? You just did it to do it So because you are really frustrated when you see one missed day. So you did it, but your heart wasn't in it, but you did it. Okay, And so either way, you didn't really engage with God that day. You maybe spent a little bit of a moment. You talked to Him, you acknowledged His presence, but you didn't really engage and participate in what He wanted you to do that day. And all of a sudden, you miss that day, and then you miss another day, and then all of a sudden, it's a week later, and you're going like, man, where? I was doing so good. I was so strong. I was so faithful. What happened? Or 
Let's bring it into our homes because the, if you're like the tire family, we struggle with this at times. But all of a sudden, you, you've got a plan. You're going to eat together and you're going to share that time together. And then all of a sudden, one meal, what happened? American Idol's on tonight. Daddy doesn't want to watch American Idol. The NBA Finals are coming on or the March Madness is happening. And my bracket is messed up. But I'm still going to watch the game. And all of a sudden you say, hey, this is good for a night. It's good for a day. And so you've got your TV trays out. And you've got your chicken nuggets and your mac and cheese. And you're watching it. You, you don't know what you're eating. But you're watching. You know, relate, or is this just the pastor family confession time? And all of a sudden you get to a couple of days. And if you're not careful, it becomes routine. And you look up one day and you go, we've got all these TVs and we've got this one table and we're using all these TVs and these couches, but we haven't used that table in about a week. So tonight, we're going to get around the table and we're going to talk. We're going to put the phones down and we're going to engage with each other. Anybody need a reminder of that from time to time? Why? Because eventually what happens in life, in real life, we drift back to, if we're not careful and intentional, we drift back to what we want to do. That's just how it works. So how do we fix it? What do we do about it? I think we have to, we have to develop a plan to, what, uh, to ask the question, what's a win in every area of my life? Okay. So if you begin to ask, what's a win for me? If, if you're a family, for instance, and you say, well, I want my children not to be brats. Okay, that's a great plan, right? I want my children to be respectful. I want them to be good-hearted. I want them to, to follow God. I want, I want all this well-roundedness. And so what do we do? We say, for instance, I want my child to be engaged in sports, and then maybe they have affinity for sports. They're, they're good at that. It comes a little natural. So you see the potential. What do you do with that potential? I've been there. You see the potential for baseball, for instance. What do you do? You get a batting coach because they're not listening to you after a certain point. Fights begin to break out in the batting cage. And it's not anybody else. It's just y'all. So you hire a batting coach. And you bring them in. And you say, fix them. Help them to, and you invest in that. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying you do that. If you're a kid, you want them to be good in school. You want them to have good grades. Not just so they can play sports, but so they can have an education and, and do things and be successful adults and contribute to society. We all want that. But if you're struggling with some class, what do you do? You ask for help, and you may even hire a tutor or invite someone in. Whatever the case may be, you care, and you place a value on that, and you invest in it. I could go on and on, and I could peel about every part of your life, and those two things may not be relatable for you, but something in your life, you cared about it enough in this world to invest in it. So let me just pose the question, that are we just as vigilant with our spiritual lives? That's what this issue of misplaced priorities is. If, if, we, if we put everything in this world in front of God and His will, then of course we're going to feel distant from Him. Because He wants us to invest in eternity. The most important thing you can do for your children, the most important thing we can do for our children in any church, the most important thing we can do is invest in their hearts. And before you leave here and go, Brian doesn't want me to, no, no. I'm saying have fun. I grew up sports. I grew up going to college. I, I, grew, I understand all that. I get it. What I'm saying is, what's, what's, of, greatest, what's of greater value? And what would our children, what would our grandchildren say if we asked them, What's the most important thing that we do in our family? Would it be you want us to be close to God? Or would it be something that has to do with this world and this life? There's nothing wrong with this. But we can have the most success here and miss out 
on what God has for us. And that's what breaks God's heart. What are we investing in? What are we doing? What are we giving our lives to? Number three, maybe it's a result of doubt. What does this look like? I know God loves me, but my life isn't going my way. There may be a season in your life when, where things are just not going well. It's not going your way. You don't feel like God's presence is, is in it. It's not involved. It's so hard. And we begin to wonder, God, why aren't you doing something about this? It may be something we help contribute to, whatever. But we're in this, and we begin to wonder, why aren't you fixing this? It, it could be any kind of relationships that we have. It could be any kind of financial struggles that we're going through. It could be friend drama. It could be all sorts of things that we're just wondering why am I going through this? Or we begin to struggle with the self-image thing. We begin to, well, my friend looks like this in, in those pictures, and so why, sh why don't I look like that? These people are friends. Why aren't they including me? All this sort of stuff. And we begin to just, God, why? Why aren't you blessing me like you seem to be blessing them? If only we could just peek behind the curtain sometimes. Amen? <laughs> if only we could just peek behind the the camera sometimes. I think we'd be a surprise that all of us have a lot of more similarities than we realize. I'm reminded of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this. If you're ever doubting that what if what is God trying to do, even if you're doing everything right, at least in your own eyes. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow to the statue. They refused to bow to this, this statue that Nebuchadnezzar had had. It, it just created. And he said, you're going to bow down to this or you're going to be thrown in this fiery furnace, which essentially meant that they're going to die. And so instead of bowing down, they were willing to be thrown into the furnace. And here's what they determined before they stepped in the furnace, not after where God saved them and they didn't even smell like smoke, which is really cool. But what happened beforehand, they said, we will never bow to you. Whether God saves us through the fire or he takes our life through the fire, we believe in him and we will be faithful to him. And so at some point we have to come to that resolution in our own lives that whatever happens in this life, a lot of these things I can't control. So whatever God allows, whatever God doesn't seem to be doing, if it's not going my way, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to be faithful to him even if my life falls apart? Am I still going to be faithful to Him? If everyone and everything falls away, am I still going to keep my focus and my faith in Him? So let's do something. If we ask this question, where is God? I don't know if you've ever asked that question, but as your pastor, I have. Where, where is God? Why, why didn't He intercede in this? Where, where is He in this season? Because it doesn't feel like something he would want, right? When it's really about, it's not what I want. So think about that season. Think about that time. Think about that period in your life where you feel like, and you, you ask that question, where is God? Because he doesn't seem to be engaged. So what I want to do is I'm going to put on the screen this, this word. And I want you to just automatically, what do you see? What do you read in there? Right? We, we automatically see two words, and we see nowhere. So let's kind of look at it from that perspective. This is how we honestly look at where is God. He is nowhere. He seems to be not engaged. He seems to be not involved because I can't see him blessing this. This is too hard. It's too difficult. But what I would challenge you to do is begin to see it from a different perspective. It's the same word broken up in two different words. Instead of nowhere, now what if we begin to see it as he is now here? What if we begin to look at it from a perspective from our life and stop wondering if God is engaged, if God is involved, and understand that He is here. Even when Jesus came to this earth as a little baby boy, He said, God with us. Emmanuel. There's times in your life where you don't feel like God is engaged. And there's reasons for that. And there's often times we begin to say, God, where are you? God, I don't feel you. I'm not seeing your hand work. 
But here's the truth in it. If we ever feel forsaken by God, if we ever feel distant from God, guess who moved? It's always us. Because what, 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 what Jesus understood, and I want you to understand the tone, because that's important here, the tone of the phrase, why, God, why have you forsaken me? For me, I would have shouted or cried that at God. And I've done that many times. I, I, I shout, God, why are you allowing this? Why would you do this? Why would you allow my parents to be divorced? Why would you allow this to happen? Why would you allow my best friend to move? Why would you allow my best friend to, to friend somebody else and feel close to them? Why, even the minor things that, we, that God's like, really? But if, if, it, if it hurts us, then, then he cares about it. So even the little stuff, the petty stuff, it seems, is a big deal. And so let me just real quickly just say, if, if, if you're an adult and then someone of the teenage age or younger is coming to you and they have drama that's real life to them, don't shrug it off and say, that's not a big deal. Why are you worried about that? Why are you crying about it? Remember what you were like then? <laughs> Remember what it was like? Show a little compassion. Quit overlooking because you don't understand what they're going through. God was showing us on the cross. He understands. Not just what it feels like to be forsaken by God, but what it feels like for God to turn his eyes. He was not crying out at God, but he was crying out for God. And there's a big difference in that. He was longing for that intimacy to be re-engaged. He was longing for that closeness to come back. And I would venture to say that's exactly what you and I want. You came to church today. And what you're wanting is, you're wanting a stirring, I would hope, right? You're wanting to be reminded of why I put up my faith in God, why I'm going through this, why it's worth it. Why is the hardship worth it? It is worth it because God is with you. He is not wasting a hurt. He is not wasting your pain. He is not going to waste your story. He cares about you more than you could ever imagine. He loves you so much that he was willing to die for you, not just to rescue you from hell, but to give you life. So why did he ask why? Because he understood that we're going to ask the same question. He doesn't want to be distant from you. So if you're feeling distant, take a step back toward him. Recognize what it is that you're not engaging in. If it's sin, confess it. Repent of it. Get some accountability. If it's misplaced priorities, get those things back in order. If it's doubts, ask some honest questions to people that you trust and work through those answers. But you've got to resolve from the beginning, even if I don't find out all the answers, I still trust in Him. Let us pray. God, I thank you so much for your love, for your grace, your mercy. I thank you for your sacrifice more than anything. You truly understand what it's like to feel shame, to feel guilt. So in this moment, I would think there may be just a handful of people that may have yet to put their faith in you. And in this moment, I pray that we remove the distractions. We just quiet our souls and our minds and just listen to you calling out to us. If our heart is racing, it's pounding, and we can't control it, what that may mean is God is wanting into our life. He's wanting us to believe in Him. He's wanting us to admit that we're sinful. He wanting, he's wanting us just to confess that we believe and we need Him. If that's you today, your heart is racing. You know you need to invite Jesus into your life. You know that he died for you. I'd love for you and I to pray together. If you just lift your hand, 
so that we can pray together today and invite Jesus into your life. Anyone today?